Okay, so I know a lot of you have places to get, so I'll talk fast. Um, but it, basically, I'm going to show you two presentations of just kind of a stepwise ladder approach to prescribing IMT. Um, now that we've seen kind of the complexity, and I'm going to show you two cases that are maybe on the most complex side of things that we see in the UBIS clinic. Both of these are kind of pediatric, or at least were originally pediatric cases. Uh, I have no financial disclosures. Like I said, two brief cases, um, basically both anterior uveitis cases, and I'm going to highlight stepwise treatment algorithms, um, specifically in these clinical settings, so you guys get an idea of kind of how we do these things. Um, so the first case uh, is an eight-year-old healthy girl with bilateral idiopathic anterior granulomatous uveitis. Workup was unremarkable. Visual acuity was 20-25 when we first started seeing her. Pressure was 18 um, in the right, 33 in the left. She had been on long-term use of meloxicam for joint pain, uh, prednisolone drops, and homatropine um, for quite a while before she was even referred to our uveitis clinic. Um, when we saw her in clinic, she had uh, KP nodules, 3 to 4 plus AC cell. We quickly discontinued the meloxicam, um, started an oral steroid taper to quell her inf inflammation rather quickly, also stopped, um, well, sorry, start, uh, and continued homatropine and prednisolone due to the anterior chamber inflammation. Um, and then these, this is actually a photograph from her um, uh, clinical exam, I'm oh, sorry, uh, there we go, with all these KPs here. Um, you can't even appreciate the cell. So we're talking about a significant amount of inflammation um, despite uh, pretty frequent use of prednisolone, even meloxicam. Um, so then uh, we, after starting the oral steroid taper, we did an infectious rule out to make sure none of this was infectious. Um, like I said, workup was unremarkable. Um, so then we quickly added methotrexate so then we could taper the steroids. Um, due to kind of multiple inflammatory bouts over the coming months, um, she required multiple reinitiations of oral steroid tapers. Um, and her vision continued to decline in the right eye despite our best efforts. Most of that was due to cataract development from persistent inflammation and topical steroids. So methotrexate was increased. There were compliance issues kind of scattered throughout this entire clinical encounter. Um, and then throughout this, she starts developing band keratopathy to kind of complicate matters uh, with ongoing inflammation. So then she was started on Humira um, in addition to methotrexate. Um, and we eventually got her inflammation controlled for long enough, um, or we felt at least long enough that we could actually undergo uh, performing a parse plane of vitrectomy, uh, cataract surgery with a PI, pupillary membranectomy, and a posterior synechiolysis. She, within three months of that uh, kind of complex surgery, she was already 2040 uncorrected with no inflammation. And I'll talk more about our specific uh, perioperative regimen because I think that's important to discuss um, because these are fairly complex surgeries when we do step into them, but I'll show that at the end. So then the second case was maybe even more complex, and maybe not necessarily just from an ocular standpoint, but from a systemic um, standpoint as well. So this 48-year-old lady um, had been diagnosed, obviously, many years prior with JIA um, and had been followed by Dr. Vitale for quite some time, but then moved and was kind of lost, uh, at least to us, for six years, but had been following with an outside ophthalmologist when she was finally referred back to us. Her remarkable medical history was positive for JIA, and she was also HLA B27 positive. Um, she had had multiple ocular flares even prior to returning to us and then what was documented in the referral letter back to us. She had had cataract surgery in both eyes and a retinal detachment repair of the right eye. She was currently on Simzio, which is an anti-TNF agent, when she was um, returned back to our care and then had been on Pred Forte four to five times a day in both <coughs> eyes. <laughs> Fortunately, her joints were well controlled on Simsia, but obviously her ocular inflammatory component um, was not under well control. Um, she had previously been stopped when she was under our care um, on methotrexate. Um, she had had that stopped due to elevated liver enzymes. Remicade and tocilizumab had also failed to control joint inflammation, but it worked quite nicely for her ocular inflammation. So we've also, we've already gone through multiple agents at this point when she's referred back to us with 
Um, light perception, vision in the right eye, most of that's due to a retinal detachment. Then 2100 in the left eye with a positive APD on the right. Um, and then a plasmoid-like reaction with 2 plus AC cell in the left. Pretty consistent with an HLA-B27 flare and a pretty significant one at that. Um, so she needed the full, port, full court press because she was monocular and had significant intraocular inflammation. So she was switched from Pred Forte to Durazole. She received an STK at that point and was started on Celsept. Um, and just to kind of highlight what we usually do in adults for Celsept, we start at 500 twice a day for two weeks um, and then increase that to one gram twice a day. Or real, can, real fast, for those of us who are sore, what's STK? Uh, 17 ounce catalog, sorry. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'm just going to point out that, that I, I, we're getting to the point where we're, we're using our own individual language, and it's part of the, and, and it's not just us, I mean, in, in the sciences and other yeah. areas. And if you're not in on the lingo, I mean, I, we all know exactly who that is. I mean, I, I just have got to be careful of some of these. Yeah. Yes, a sub ounce kinolog, so basically a periocular steroid injection. Um, she then came back um, about a month later after that subtenons kenalog injection. Pressure was fine, however, returned three months later with recurrent AC inflammation, CME, and subretinal fluid, which you can see here on this OCT in the left eye. It was also complaining of significant amount of diarrhea. Uh, that was felt to be related to the cell seps. So both cell sep and Simsia were stopped because they were not controlling intraocular inflammation. She was started on Humira and Imaran, which is an anti-metabolite, and given an Ozerdex in the left eye due to this CME and subretinal fluid. Despite uh, these changes, as well as increasing doses over the next several months, she continued to have both ocular and joint flares, despite, uh, like I said, increased dosing. So Humira was eventually changed to another anti-TNF agent that we heard about earlier, uh, which did not control her joint disease, but seemed to be doing okay from an ocular standpoint. So that was discontinued um, and switched for rituximab. Um, she has been on rituximab for the last five or six months and seems to be doing relatively well with resolution of CME, subretinal fluid, and her significant AC inflammation. Um, so at least what are some of the pearls that we've heard about this morning that we can kind of glean from uh, what do we do with IMT, what do we do with uveitis cases. So I think the first and most important thing is to get a, an appropriate diagnosis so we can treat that. Um, and so that requires both a you know, full history and examination um, and then a differential diagnosis of can't miss diagnoses. And I'll show here on the next slide and I'll mention it now. Um, we always need to, um, you know, reconsider diagnoses if they're not um, kind of um, following what we would expect. And then the big important one before we start IMT, um, we didn't show anything related to this, but we need to make sure we rule out infectious etiologies, and I didn't even show that we were ruling that out prior to starting IMT and, and oral steroids in all of these cases. Then we've kind of seen this through all the cases presented today, but Anterior inflammation, at least for anterior uveitis, you know, topical steroids to treat the inflammation. Then some sort of steroids, so whether that's oral steroids, subtenon kinolog, um, whether that's just typically topical steroids, any of those agents, if that doesn't work, then usually the next step is anti-metabolites with a steroid bridge, then uh, plus or minus a T-cell inhibitor like cyclosporin. Then we've heard a lot about biologics this morning. Um, and then something we rarely use, at least at this point, due to side effect profiles or alkylating agents. Um, and that's kind of the stepwise approach we have um, in the uveitis clinic. Then the other important regard that we didn't kind of nail down, but I briefly mentioned earlier, was we try to get at least three months of intraocular inflammation control prior to initiating surgery. Of course, there have been cases that I think my glaucoma colleagues know about um, that we weren't able to do that prior to needing emergent tubes recently. Um, so there are cases where that's just not possible. Um, then judicious use of perioperative steroid tapers. So I didn't discuss this with the first case, but she uh, basically had one milligram per kilogram per day steroid taper around the actual surgery. 
And what we normally would do would be two days prior to surgery and then uh, five days post-op, we do this one milligram per kilogram and then every five days tapering that fairly quickly. So what would that look like in adults? So we'd start at 60 milligrams for a day, took seven total days of that, and then we'd quickly go down to 40 for five days, 20 for five days, 10 milligrams for five days, and then stop to help quell the inflammation induced by the actual surgery. Um, and then there are obviously some pitfalls that I've already kind of briefly mentioned. Um, one, um, ruling out infectious etiologies. The second, um, under-treating inflammation. Um, so kind of on the opposite sides of both spectrums. Um, so infectious etiologies versus treating uh, or under-treating auto-inflammatory conditions. Um, so I say go big or go home. So you really want to hit the inflammation hard early. Otherwise, uh, you're going to see it recur um, and be back to where you were when you first started. Uh, then the other issue is tapering too fast, so you can taper too fast. Um, of course, on the other side of that, if you taper too slow, then you get, um, at least from perioperative or from oral steroids, you can get side effects from the oral steroids, which is what we've also heard about. So you're walking a fine line with all of these agents. Um, and then I've already mentioned this, but failure to reconsider original diagnoses um, if things don't pan out as you would expect them to. And we've seen that um, recently, um, even a case yesterday that we were looking at in clinic. So um, it's something to always be reconsidering diagnoses as you're seeing these patients with complex histories. There's a lot of information, there's a lot of reading out there that you can go to. Um, to read further um, into IMT and doing these things. Um, but I think the big thing is uh, just making sure that you have a diagnosis that you're treating. Um, and then there's a lot of images that have been shown today, but I think the biggest thing that we need to thank everyone for is specifically the patients and their families that have let us take care of their ocular health. Um, and then the rest of the UBIS team um, that lets me take part um, with their patients and their care of the patients and the imaging staff with all the great images that we've had. Um, so I think, uh, so okay good, I talked fast enough that I don't think you guys are too late to your clinics and surgeries and such, so. <coughs>